Okay, so we're talking about um, ancient Rome again today. We're, this is part two. And this part of ancient Rome focuses on not the Republic, but the empire part of it. So we're also gonna talk about the fall of Rome and we're gonna talk about some of the contributions of Rome, um, some things that they gave to, to the world. So as always, just quickly go through the procedures. Um, we want you to make sure you stay focused. Go ahead and participate when asked. Uh, use the chat for live lesson purposes only. Uh, be respectful to one another and don't leave the session early unless you absolutely um, have to. Uh, make sure you follow the Microsoft team rules, which is turn off your camera and microphone. If you wish to speak, click the raise hand button. Once Mr. Privatera um, calls your name, then you can go ahead and unmute yourself to speak. And then when you're done, go ahead and remute yourself and um, lower your hand. And of course, as always, make sure that we learn lots while we're here, okay? Um, uh, Kamani, what's your, what's your question? I can't see anything. Okay, if that's the case for whatever reason, then just go ahead and log out and come back in. Usually that helps solve the problem, okay? All right, so. Let's look at our learning goal for today. So our um, our main learning goal is, is where we want you to be is at number three, okay? And that's the student will explain the contributions of the Roman Empire, tell which culture was the most influential to Rome and describe what caused the fall of Rome, okay? So that's hopefully where you're going to be by the end of this class. If right now you're at a one or a two, that's completely fine. Um, hopefully after our lesson today, you will move up a little bit and you will be higher closer to a three. If you're already at a three, Maybe you came to the morning lesson, that's great too, okay? But just take a moment to uh, kind of tell yourself where, where are you on that scale? Now everyone's coming in, all right, good. Okay, so. Let's look at the Roman Empire, okay? The part, the, the um, probably the most famous era of Roman history, okay? Um, we're going to, Look first at some of these early emperors. Um, Julius Caesar, we talked a little bit about last time, and he kind of takes power away from the Roman Senate and makes it an empire. And his adopted nephew, Caesar Augustus, rules the empire for 40 years. Um, he, um, ex the empire, I should say, experiences this era known as Pax Romana, meaning Roman peace. Um, in this time, life in the empire kind of improves. And after Augustus's death, Pax Romana continues. Um, and it continues through, um, including the emperor Trajan, who under his rule, Rome kind of expands to its largest um, it is. And if you look at the map that's here, everything in red you see is what the Roman empire encompasses during his, his time as emperor. So you can see it's a huge empire. It's, it's really quite similar to the size of the United States today, which back then was a, a large, um, very large empire, hard to kind of control when traveling um, is much slower than it is today. Okay, so Emperor Trajan, um, his, he, he, he's one of the many emperors that come after Augustus. Um, and he's actually known as, as a very popular um, empire, he, our emperor, sorry, he is actually called Optimus among the people. And Optimus, if you're a Transformers fan, right? Optimus Prime. Optimus means the best, right? So, so really the people called him just the best, the best emperor there is. Um, the territory expands so much, it's all the way to Britain in the north and um, as far south as Egypt, as far east as um, kind of Mesopotamia, and as far west as um, is Spain and Portugal. So it's very, very expansive, this empire, and brought the Romans great influence and great and great wealth. So how it's governed is kind of divided up into two kind of um, pieces. There's the senatorial provinces, which are kind of like the original areas of Rome. It's the places that have been established as Roman for a long time. And in those areas, it's actually the senator or the Senate, I should say, who um, appoints the governors to rule the areas. 
The imperial provinces are kind of the areas that are more outside the center of Rome. Um, and they're kind of the more recent acquisitions to the Roman Empire. And they're under control of the emperor because the emperor goes out and um, selects the governors himself. And those governors almost always will go along with exactly what the emperor wants, since he's the one that put them in power. So what's the difference, right? What is Rome under the empire like compared to when it was a republic that we talked about last time? And really that's the Roman Republic had a system of checks and balances. And this system was in place to keep um, any person or group from becoming too powerful. But in the Roman Empire, there's no such system. That system goes out the window. So there is still a Senate, right? The Senate still exists, and it's made up of kind of wealthy individuals that were put there by the emperor. And the Senate would always agree with him politically, because if not, the emperor could just toss them. Uh, the Senate would no longer pass any laws without the emperor's approval, and the emperor himself could choose whether or not to go to war. Uh, I found this great little chart online, right? And it says, in the Republic, who's the leader? Well, it's elected officials. But in the empire, it's just the emperor's the leader. How long does the leader rule? Well, in the Roman Republic, it was just one year. But in the empire, it was for life, even though lots of them were assassinated, right? There's about 82 emperors throughout the history of Rome. And I think 20% of them or so were actually assassinated. So not very good um, job security if you're an emperor. Um, how do the leaders get their power? Well, in, in the Republic, they were appointed by the Senate, but in the empire, they were kind of inherited or, or, or took it by force, right? They got it from their parents or they took it by force. So um, some of the emperors that kind of stand out in, in Roman history are the following one. There's um, Vespasian, and he's kind of the military, um, the military kind of declared him the emperor. He was a great warrior, and he's the one that built the Colosseum, which is, you'll see the middle picture there. And the Colosseum is like a big a sporting arena that still stands in Rome today. And he rules over a great time of peace and is generally looked at as a, as a good emperor that people really love. Um, Hadrian is the next one, and he realized that controlling such a large emperor is going to be very difficult, and so he kind of stops territorial acquisition, right? He stops Rome from growing, and instead he builds walls around the borders of the um, emperor to try to the empire to try to protect it from invaders from the outside. Then you have Marcus Aurelius, and he created a military system where rank was earned and not necessarily dependent on your social class. So if you weren't just if you come from the rich families, you become a general, right? Instead, it was you all start at the bottom and have to work your way up um, due to strength and in um, and, and, and abilities. And he also takes a lot, a lot of steps to kind of strengthen the government and the army of ancient Rome. So the next empire is, is um, Diocletian, and he kind of becomes an emperor when Rome is on the verge of collapse. And he creates a system called the Tetrarchy, which is four rulers ruling at once, ruling together. And when he's um, when he's emperor, he realizes that it's really, really a large, um, a very large empire, hard to control. So what he thinks is if he kind of shares his duty and splits his duty among three others, then um, it'll actually be better and help him control everything more. But what ends up happening is that people kind of fight for allegiances and it really creates a civil war. Then there's Emperor Constantine, and he's probably one of the best known Roman emperors, and he's most known for converting to Christianity. He's the first emperor to become a Christian. Um, and he issues the Edict of Milan, which kind of made Christianity legal in the Roman Empire. And by the time of his death, he's actually, it's actually the preferred religion of most Romans. There's Theodosius, and he made Christianity the official religion of the empire. And he ordered kind of the destruction of a lot of these non-Christian temples in Rome, Greece, and Egypt, unfortunately. Um, and really, he um, is kind of the last emperor of, of, to rule Rome as a whole. Um, his sons are the ones that kind of split the empire into east and west that we'll get to in the next section. Next, we're going to talk about Pompeii and, and Herculaneum. These are two very well-known um, cities in Rome because of the huge destruction that happened. So these two cities were destroyed by a volcanic eruption, Mount Vesuvius, in 49 AD or 49 CE. 
Thousands of people were killed. However, the city was really well preserved beneath all this volcanic ash. And when archaeologists kind of discovered the city centuries later, they found that everything was perfectly preserved. And they found these beautiful wall paintings and lots of artifacts that, that really taught us a lot about the Roman world. They taught us that um, sculpture and paintings were kind of the main art of the empire and that wealthy people sometimes had their portraits carved in marble. And these paintings were lots of times of a variety of subjects. They included animals, objects, landscapes, and, and Roman gods. And they had marble reliefs, which is like a flat uh, piece of marble where a picture was kind of carved in into it. Okay, but lots of great things that we that we've gotten from this huge destruction of these two cities. David, do you have a question? Yes, is it named after Hercules? Um, it could be. That's a good question. I actually don't know where Herculaneum comes from. If I had to guess, there's probably a Greek a Greek word that kind of connects the two. I, I would be I would be surprised if that's not the case. John? Yeah, because the Roman form of Hercules is Heracles. Well, the Greek form is Heracles, so this is most likely the Roman form. Right. Correct. But but, but I'm sure there's a commonality of the two words. Yeah. Um, Let's see. So the Roman, um, the economy of ancient Rome. So under the empire, trade in India and China increased um, after the Romans conquered Egypt. Over 120 ships were making the voyage from Egypt into Asia every year for silk and women's clothes, um, because silk for women's clothing had become more popular than ever. So there was a huge demand for it. More and more people were, were making the route to Asia and um, really wealth grew as a result. So Roman currency was standardized. That means that they had they used the same money throughout the entire Roman Empire. So in this case, coins usually bore the image of the current emperor. So every time there was a, a new emperor, they'd have to remake the coins with that emperor's face on it. Romans made or minted coins from metals found all over the empire. The coins that were minted in Rome, in the city of Rome, were made from gold. But mints outside the city of Rome and other parts of the empire were made from whatever metal they had nearby. So it could be bronze, iron, or just different alloys, which is like a combination of metals. Okay, But, but the actual coin, the look of the coin, would have been standardized throughout the entire empire. So the birth of Christianity is one of the most important things that happened um, during the, the Roman Empire. So people in Rome were usually very tolerant of most of the other religions. Um, in the first decades of the Common Era, people began to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ, which becomes Christianity. The Romans wanted people from other cultures to adopt to the adopt the Roman way of life, but they made they kind of um, made this way of life more inviting by welcoming other people um, and other people's ideas into their culture. But Christianity was a little different because Christianity was monotheistic. They only believed in one God. And this was just too different from the mainstream Roman beliefs at the time. So Romans really wanted to get rid of Christians and they didn't like the Christian community in Rome. And so they persecuted people, especially under the reign of Marcus Aurelius. And persecution Persecution just means to kind of um, harm people because of their beliefs, because of something that they believe in. But Christianity grows. In Paul of Tarsus, it was kind of um, the, the reason for that. He was a former Roman official who actually, whose job it was to go around and execute a lot of these Christians. But he actually ends up becoming a Christian himself. And he becomes one of the most important missionaries. And he's responsible for going around the Mediterranean and kind of preaching the words of Christ and, and, and making Christianity grow throughout what is much of the Roman Empire. Um, he um, kind of... Um, it's not working at all. Oh, me. there we go. So um, he helps kind of build early churches and he's actually ended up become, uh, he actually ends up getting arrested and ooh, beheaded, okay? Um, but that's okay because um, it really allows the church to thrive and grow and, um, and gives us the Christianity that we still have today. So centuries later, Emperor Constantine ends up converting to Christianity and he issues, like we said before, this Edict of Milan, which makes it legal for Roman citizens to become Christian. But for a long period of time, for hundreds of years, if you were Christian, you had to do it secretively or quietly, or you risked um, being put to death or persecuted. 
All right, let's see how we do here. So my first question here is, um, which emperor was responsible for extending the boundaries of the Roman Empire to what is shown on this map? Augustus, uh, Trajan, Marcus Aurelius, or Constantine? Which one is responsible for this? Grace, what do we think? Trajan. Good. B. Come on. All right. How did the Edict of Milan contribute to the growth and longevity of the Roman Empire? It made it safe for the larger Christian community to practice their religion. It made it illegal to practice any religion other than Christianity. It made um, the, a tax system that helped fund an empire, and it created a less rigid social class system. Which, which one did the Edict of Milan contribute to? Adan, what do you think? A. A. Come on. There we go. Which of the following originated um, with the with the Emperor Diocletian? Um, was it the the Tretriarchy, the um, the Senate, the Trim, the Trimunsvate? I can never say that word. And the Edict of Milan. All right, Jonathan, your turn. The answer is A. Good. The treachery archie. Say that 10 times fast. All right. The political, oh. structure, the political structure of the Roman Empire included all of the following. So my morning class had a little bit of trouble with this. Let's see how we do, okay? So we're saying here the Roman Republic, right, had all of these things except this one piece that the Roman Empire, I'm sorry, the Roman Empire had all these same things that the Roman Republic had except this one thing. So what's the one thing that the empire did not have that the Republic did have? Um, let's see, Graham, what do we think? Are you there, Graham? You gotta unmute yourself. Oh, sorry, um, B. B, good, that's exactly right. Checks and balances. All right, and which statement about Christianity is false? So three of these are true and one of them is false. Paul of Tarsus was an early leader of the church that helped spread Christianity throughout Rome. Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity and allowed the citizens of Rome to become Christian. The Romans initially did not like Christianity because it was polytheistic. Christianity is a religion that is based on the teachings of Jesus Christ. So which one is false? David, what do we think? C. C. Romans did not like Christianity because it was polytheistic. If that last word was monotheistic, right, then then maybe it would be a correct statement. But right, remember, Christianity they believe in just one God, not multiple gods. All right, let's see how we do here. Which emperor is the one um, that under this empire it was the largest that it was in history? Let's see. Marcus, do we know? E. Say it again. E. E. I think that's what you said. And it's right if that's what you said. E, good. Um, the next one is what, or this was the first Roman Empire, emperor. Which one's the first Roman emperor? Right, Julius Caesar handed the empire to him and he becomes the first emperor. Adon, what do we think? B, Augustus. B, Augustus, good job, I agree. This emperor was the last to rule Rome before it was split in two. So we talked about him briefly. Remember, his each one of his sons gets gets half. Savia, did you know? No, shy. Okay, Jonathan, go ahead. Your turn. It was B. I was waiting all all last of the morning for you to call me because I knew this one. <laughs> well, there we go. All right. This emperor built walls around the Roman Empire to secure its borders. Which emperor built the walls around the empire? Come on, guys. You got this one. Who built the walls? Ella, what do you think?
E. What'd you say? E. E. We already we already chose E. How's the oh, first? Oh darn it! Never <laughs> mind. <laughs> That's all right. So this one's actually going to be F. So this one is um, Hadrian. Okay. And then this emperor was the first to promote men in the military based on their performance rather than their social class. David, what do we think? C. C, Marcus Aurelius, good job. And then finally, he was the first Roman emperor to be a Christian. This one should be very easy because it's the last one left. The fact that every hand isn't in the air is shocking. Joe, what do we think? You called my name right? Yep. yep. A. A. Good. Constantine. All right. Good job, guys. All right. Hands down, and we're going to move on to the next section, and that's the fall of the West. These other sections go a little bit faster than the first one did. So, hold on. We got a couple people joining us, which is good. Make sure. Sylvia, did you have a question, or did you just forget to put your hand down? Okay. So, the fall of the West. We're gonna start by talking about this era, this era known as Pax Romanum, okay? And that's a period of time that lasts about 200 years in which the empire experienced great peace, okay? And it's a time when the empire was at its greatest. And it had a period of five really well-known um, emperors. Now, some of them are the ones we talked about in the last section, but a couple of them are new. So these are the ones who really kind of are known for doing great things while the empire was at its height. So the first one is Nerva, and that's known for giving poor people land to farm. And he's understood, uh, and he understood that a strong country needed to have food and good farmers. Uh, Trajan, like we just talked about, he's the one known for expanding Rome to its largest territorial point. Um, Hadrian, like we said, the one who built the walls, but he is also known for traveling through the empire. He wanted to see for himself how well connected his empire was. And um, Rome was known for its network of roads that we'll talk about again in a minute. And he wanted to travel these roads and to meet the people and see this empire for himself. Then we have um, Antonius Pius, and he's known for keeping the peace and being good to his people. And he helped to really kind of stabilize the economy. And then you have Marcus Aurelius, and he's known um, to, to believe that the gods, he's known for believing that the gods did not literally like Christians and that they wanted them killed or exiled from, from the country. So it's not really a, a good thing by today's standards, but in this period of time in Roman history, Christians were looked at as kind of the enemy or the bad guys. So what he was doing was popular among the people, okay, which is why he's remembered then as a, as a good emperor. So why, why did Rome fall? Um, so the Roman people were, were proud people and they believed that their ancestors had created a civilization that really could not be conquered. And the civilization covered such a vast area and includes such a large number of people that the Roman empire was a powerful force and it had a feared army. Its laws, art and culture were copied by many other civilizations. So why did this great civilization fall? It fell due to its expansion um, it was divided eventually into Eastern and Western halves. Rome suffered ongoing attacks by these fierce dramatic invaders. Its people as well as its leaders had really become weak and the people kind of no longer stood up for these Roman values and, and ideas. Savia, do you have a question? No, okay. So why was the Roman Empire split into the Eastern and Western sections? So you're going to see on this map, you have orange to the West and the red kind of to the East. They split the empire in half. And Rome had expanded so much that it becomes just really difficult to control. So Emperor Diocletian, he kind of decides to build a second capital city in the East to help kind of control the East and West better. And the new capital is located on the Black Sea, and it sits kind of at the crossroads between the Eastern Roman Empire and, and the Asian continent. So this city they call Constantinople, um, naming it after Emperor Constantine. Now today, that city actually has a different name. It's called Istanbul. So it's Istanbul, Turkey. Um, and trade kind of expands in the east and really allows the east to become very wealthy, very well connected, whereas the west, with, with the city of Rome as the capital, really kind of starts to be to struggle more. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in the coming slides. So tax is a very big part of what really causes the West to, to, to falter a little bit. Um, 
so the emperor uh, Diocletian, he kind of sees his growing wealth and, and he, he kind of sees that the wealth is growing in the east and takes over that side. So in the west, they still need lots of money and, and, and they have to pay for an army, which included kind of non-Roman soldiers that they would pay to help fight for them to fight off these invasions. And they needed money to pay for these soldiers and they needed money for, for roads um, to connect its cities and provinces. The government got money from taxes, but the citizens in the East were wealthy and could pay these taxes. But in the West, the people had trouble getting jobs and, and, and making money and so that they couldn't pay taxes, which means the government didn't have the same amount of money in the West and they were getting far weaker. Also guys, the West had too many slaves. And what happens when you have too many slaves is that there's not Roman citizens to, to have jobs, to work. So they're not able to make money and therefore pay taxes. So too many slaves led to um, a partial collapse of that Western um, side of the Republic as well. Oops, all right. So then you have the invasions of the barbarians, right? And this, um, if there had been only one group of invaders, the West probably could have fought them off. But the problem was, there was a series of these invasions and they were kind of relentless and constant. And over time, these invasions of these barbarians from the North kind of chip away and chip away and causes the, um, the Western part of Rome to become weaker and weaker. Um, the Vistagoths are the people who came from um, Sweden, right? The part of the Goths who come from Sweden. And they're really under attack themselves from the Huns over in Mongolia that we'll talk more about in module, I believe it's eight. Um, and so they're looking to get to get pushed out. Of, they're looking to get away from their homelands, and the only place they can go is really into Rome. So they start pushing into Rome, um, really out of necessity. Um, and what they end up doing is 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 really weakening the borders as as they kind of have to deal with these relentless, constant attacks. The Vandals is another. Um, group from a region that is now Germany, and they attack the city of Rome. And they're kind of unsuccessful, but their advance causes great destruction. Um, there's another group of people that attack Rome and actually hold the city for ransom. They say, we're going to stay here and, and, and cause havoc on the city until you pay us money, right? So they then attack the Roman Empire in North Africa, these Vandals, and they actually end up settling there because they're successful in taking parts of it over. Other Germanic tribes continue kind of these small attacks. And over time, like we said, it weakens them and their capital city, Rome, is plundered at one point. Um, so now this kind of constant attacks mixed with general poverty of the people means that, you know, the, the Western side is really just not performing very well. And there's also a kind of an epidemic of poor leadership. So the Western Romans, they really needed a strong leader to kind of help bring them together and bring them out of this. But for many years, they had a series of kind of poorly trained, weak emperors in Rome. Uh, Romulus Augustulus was just a boy when he becomes emperor, and neither the Roman people nor the army really liked him very much, and his rule only lasts a few months. Rome's army was actually led by a barbarian, one of these people from outside that, that they had paid to fight for them. He actually kind of kicks out that, that weak child emperor, and that kind of marks the end of the Western Roman Empire, and really marks the end of, the, of, of Rome as we know it. The Eastern part of the Roman Empire maintains its wealth and becomes the Byzantine Empire and lasts for about a thousand more years. So really it's the Western half that, that doesn't do very well, but the Eastern half kind of continues on for, for quite some time. All right. Why is Emperor Antonius Pius remembered? So is he remembered for keeping the peace and being good to his people, for expanding the emperor to its largest point, for outlawing Christianity twice and for making slavery illegal. Which one is he remembered for? Adon, what do we think? A. A, keeping the peace and being good to his people. Good job. So which of the above is not one of the Pax Romana em emperors? Is it Marcus Aurelius, Caligula, um, Hadrian, or Nerva? Which one is not one of those great emperors? Marcus, what do we think? E. Say again? E. I'm not really sure what you're saying. Say it loud, maybe. B, e, Caligula. Good, B, Caligula. Good job. Caligula is actually known as a terrible emperor who's very bloody and ruthless. Um, not known as one of the good ones, for sure. 
Which of the following was not a reason that the Roman Empire was split into East and West? So which one is not a reason why? So three of them is a reason why, one of them is not. The empire was too big and splitting it made it easier to control. The East was getting wealthier than the West. The Silk Road ended in Eastern Rome, which gave it more trade possibilities. The army was getting too powerful and the emperor feared um, its military power. So they split the empire in half to weaken the army. Which one is not a reason why? Ella, do we know? D. D, good job. How did money play a role in the fall of the Roman Empire? The um, West was getting rich from trade and the East remained poor. The East was printing all the money and the West was not. The people living in the West couldn't afford their taxes and therefore the government had no money. And as the East and the West both got wealthy, so did, um, I'm sorry, so, so did their military and they attack each other. So what's, what role does money play in the splitting of East and West? Savia, do you know? Are you there? I see that you're unmuting, but then I still can't hear you. Um, Adan, go ahead. A. So if if A was um, the East was getting rich and the West remained poor, then it would actually be correct. But we're talking here on this one is that people living in the West couldn't afford their taxes, right? Therefore, the government had no money. Which term is used to describe the Vistagoths, the Vandals, and others who invaded from the North? Which, one, which term do we use? Do we use barbarians, untouchables, outcasts, or border ruffians? Evelyn, what do we think? Barbarians. Good. Barbarians. And then what was not a result of the attacks from the North um, the northern barbarians on Rome. So which one is not a result of it? It weakened the army over time. Multiple emperors were killed. Rome was plundered or held for ransom and repeated destruction caused economic difficulties. Which one is not one of the, one of the reasons? Or not one of the results, I should say. Ella, what do we think? B. B, good, we never talk about multiple emperors being killed. Good, good job. All right, so most of you have actually done assignment 5.05 already, so I'm gonna keep it pretty quick here, but um, you should probably know that this assignment has two parts to it, okay? And a lot of kids are, are, are either doing something really simple, uh, a little simple mistake in step one that's easily fixed, or they're just skipping step, step two altogether. So I'm just gonna take one quick second. Step one says, here are six dates. And here are six events that deal with the fall of the empire. So match up these, ev these events with these dates, okay? So they want you to use these events and these dates, but make sure you put the correct event with the correct date. And then when you put them in your timeline, make sure you put them in order. So I have a lot of kids that are just leaving it in the order that they give you, and you're not supposed to do that, right? I'll have to take off points if you do that. So make sure I would start by putting those dates in order and then figuring out which event goes with which date and put it on the timeline, okay? So that's step one. Step two is then just answer that question, okay? Now the question is just the fall of the Roman Empire was not due to one event, but due to many events combined. So answer that question, right? But you wanna make sure that you hit the minimum required sentences. It has to be five to eight sentences. A lot of kids are getting very skimpy and they're not following the directions and they're giving me like one or two sentences, right? I'm gonna have to take off points for that. So make sure you're always hitting the minimum required sentences. That's true on tests and all these assignments, okay? But Don, do you have a question about this assignment? No, okay, great. So we're gonna move on then. If you have any questions, you can feel free to text me or anything if you need to for this, okay? 
All right, so let's talk about our last section, which is the contributions of Rome. So in early Rome, the patricians and the, and the plebeians, right, made up most of, of, um, most of the, the Egyptian, the Roman society. At first, the patricians allowed the plebeians just a little bit of power, right? The upper class allowed the lower class just a little bit of, of power. But over time, things changed, right? Efforts of the plebeians, the lower class, kind of to gain power inspired a lot of other societies throughout the world, right? And including the United States and our founding fathers, right? They always now, because of this kind of push to give the lower classes more of a say, right? That was a big influence in the United States government as well, right? Everyone has equal opportunity under the law. Roman culture valued strength, loyalty, practicality, religious devotion, modesty. Um, so many societies actually follow this Roman example and share these same values afterwards. And in Rome, elders thought that people were kind of losing their values towards the end and thought that, you know, the kids these days, they don't know anything, right? Kind of like you hear your grandparents say. But there's actually evidence to suggest that, that these values actually were kind of slipping towards the end of the Roman Empire. So really one of the big contributions are these, this values system that they set up for later civilizations. Without a doubt, the biggest contribution to society from the Roman empire is Christianity. Um, the Romans generally tolerated different religious groups. As long as worshipers honored Roman gods and the emperor, the government usually left them alone. Most people were polytheistic, right? The Jews, however, were monotheistic. They worshiped only one God. Jesus was a Jew, and when he was 30 years old, he began to preach, and large crowds began to follow him. He told stories about God and was said to perform these great healings. Twelve of his followers, called disciples, helped Jesus spread his message throughout the Roman Empire. The Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, uh, had Jesus crucified due in part to his large followings. Right? It became They thought that having all these followers was a threat to the Roman um, authority in the area and Roman security. So they put him to death. And then it said that Jesus came back to life after being dead for three days. And this is kind of the beginning of the teachings of, of Christianity. So after Jesus's death and resurrection, um, a, a Jewish leader named Paul kind of played a large role in spreading Christianity. And he became a follower of, of Jesus. Um, he spread Jesus's teaching to non-Jews. And until Paul, Christianity was seen as just kind of a little part of Judaism, right? It's kind of like a little offshoot of Judaism. But once Paul spreads Christianity all over the continent, right, it, it becomes its own kind of separate standalone religion. The letters of Paul and the Gospels accounts of Jesus's life and ministry make up much of what is the New Testament in the Bible. And the refusal of Christians to worship the emperor as a, as a god kind of caused trouble and many were killed for their beliefs. And then once again, like we said before, um, the Christian church continues to grow and partly because it really taught about hope after death, right? And the emperor Constantine granted Roman citizens the freedom to worship as they choose. And um, emperor um, Theodosius kind of made it the official religion of the Roman empire towards the end. And Christianity continues to grow um, when the Roman Empire in the West declines. The actual, it's actually the Christian church that kind of takes over kind of that leadership role in Western Europe. And it becomes the dominant kind of power in Western Europe for another 1,000 years, right? The, 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 the Christian church, right, really is kind of the center of European power for the next uh, millennium after the Roman Empire falls. Romans love the Greeks. So Romans followed the Greeks example in almost every area of life, art, literature, philosophy, religion, education, right? Romans often hired Greek artists to kind of create their paintings and sculptures, their landscapes, portraits, and uh, wall paintings had many realistic details, just like the Greeks did, and they called it realism, right? If it has realistic details in their artwork, it's called realism. The Romans also imitated the Greeks in architecture. However, they kind of added their own little spin to it. They had um, curved lines called arches, and they also had vaults in, in, in domes. So they were the first one to use kind of domes like you see in that top picture, and arches you see kind of at the bottom pictures. And they're the first people to use concrete also on a large scale. And they also had Greek um, philosophy kind of woven into Roman teachings as well. So you're going to see lots of lots of Greek influence in art, 
architecture, philosophy, and even the religion that we talked about last time. So what the Romans built. So the first thing they built is kind of that upper right-hand side there, and that's the Pantheon. And it's an example of a huge building that the Romans built. Um, it was made of concrete partly, right? And it's used, uh, and it was used to create that dome shape. It serves as a temple to the Roman guards and Roman gods. And later it was kind of converted into a Christian church, which it still is today. Another example is the Colosseum in Rome, which is on the left side there. And the Colosseum is like a giant amphitheater, which um, is a building without a roof where people would gather to watch actors perform, gladiator fights, and, and other sports. Um, both the Pantheon and the Colosseum still stand today. You can go if you go to Rome and see them both. Um, the Romans also built a complex network of roads that connected their cities to the capital. There's an expression that says all, all roads lead to Rome, right? And, and that's due to this, to this fact, to this, to this um, system of roads. It's very similar to the Incas and what the Incas did in connecting their, their roads to their, to their cities. Um, it's, I think, 50,000 miles of roads altogether, which is, which is huge. They also have aqueducts, which you see in that center picture there. And aqueducts are kind of stone structures. They kind of like bridges, but they're designed to bring water from the mountainside to the hillsides down into the cities. And those, they would dump into public baths or, or fountains. And even if you're wealthy, into your home directly. So it was kind of like a, like a man-made river, right? That would bring this water through from faraway places into the cities where they were used. A lot of these aqueducts still stand today throughout Europe. You can, you can see them in different places if you go travel there. And their contributions to language. Um, Romans spoke a language called Latin. And a few centuries after the Roman Empire fell, the Latin language kind of fizzles out. Today, the only place you hear Latin spoken is um, in some churches and religious services. Uh, many of the regions that Rome had taken over start speaking languages that are kind of based off of Latin. And these languages include Italian, French, Spanish, Portuguese, and even Romanian. So these languages, um, yes, they're different, but they have lots of similarities, lots of common roots and things that kind of make them these romance languages, as we call them. English is not a romance language. We have lots of words that come from Latin phrases, but our language as a whole doesn't follow a lot of the same rules as these romance languages do. So our language is not based on Latin, even though certain words are. All right. Which of the following was a major effect of, call, of Paul's conversion to Christianity? Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. The teachings of Christianity were banned by Pontius Pilate. Uh, Christians believed to or began to debate whether Jesus was resurrected or not. Um, the teachings of Christianity were spread to non-Jews. Which one is Paul known for? Jonathan, what do we think? I would say the, uh, I would say D. D? Good, because D is the right answer, right? He's the one that helped spread the message of Christianity throughout the empire. Which of the following describes um, a Greek influence on Roman art? Which of the following describes Greek influence on Roman art? Roman art often portrayed abstract philosophical concepts. Roman art focused on realistic details. Roman art was often portrayed as equals, and Roman art was primarily on the landscape. Uh, Adon, what do you think? A. A, okay. Ella, what do you think? D. Okay. So guys, the answer for this one's actually B, right? Everything was realistic. Right, so look at that statue of that person, right? It's a very realistic look at what a human looked like, right? Lots of landscapes and, and you know, pictures of trees and mountains and things, right? So everything was very realistic. Which of the following is not a romance, a romance language based on Latin? Which one's not a romance language based on Latin? Darnell, what do we think? It's Spanish. So Spanish is one of them. Spanish is one of the ones that's based on Latin. Um, let's see. David, what do you think? German. 
German, good. So French, Italian, Spanish, those are all kind of um, based off of Latin language, but German is different. German's actually much more like English. Which of the following is not something that the Romans first used in the field of architecture? Domes, columns, concrete, or arches? Let's see. All right, David, try again. What, what is it? Domes. Okay, so they actually did use domes. Um, they're the first ones to use domes. Marcus, what do you think? E, arches. Okay, so guys, they're also the first one to use arches. So they're the first people to use concrete, arches, domes, but they're not the first people to use columns, right? The Greeks used columns before that. All right, what is an aqueduct? A bridge meant for travelers in the mountains, a device designed to bring water from nearby mountains into the cities, a decorative wall meant to worship the gods, a temple wall that was used to tell time by kind of the, the location and direction of the sun. Uh, Eliani, what do you think? B. D? B. B, okay, much better. B, there we go, good job. And then which statement about the Colosseum is false? So the Colosseum, three of these things are true, one of them is not. It held sporting events with gladiators. It was an amphitheater. It still stands today as one of Rome's most iconic landmarks. It was home to the Roman Senate. Graham, what do we think? Which one is not true? D. D, correct. Okay. So once again, the scale, right? The students will explain the contributions of the Roman Empire, tell which culture was the most influential to Rome, and describe what caused the fall of Rome. Hopefully you guys are at least at a three, which is where that kind of, where that falls. Um, hopefully that when you started, you know, you, hopefully you've moved up that scale from where you started. Maybe you were already at a three and now you're at a four. Maybe you were at a two and now you're at a three, okay? But just um, take a minute to think about that and hopefully that you're, you're able to kind of meet that learning goal. So. That really is it. Thank you guys so much for coming to the live lesson. I'm going to stick around and answer any questions that you might have. If not, you can go ahead and sign off and keep, keep submitting that work. And, and thank you very much. Remember, guys, if you need a DBA tomorrow between 10 and 11, you can sign on any time between 10 and 11, and I'll be there for DBAs, okay? If not, you can make an appointment. Bye, guys. Thanks for coming. It's, it's on the same link, right? Yep, the same exact link. Okay. Uh, Graham, do you have a question? No? Okay. Bye, guys. Thank you so much for coming. Bye. Thank you. Bye.